Uh, hello, everybody. We've got just over three minutes before we're due to start. So I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is John Mulcahy, and we're here with Jose Antonio Lopez Calvet. Uh, we'll be hosting this webinar for you this evening. Uh, at the moment, there's a hundred, uh, just under 150 people joining us. So I would say in the couple of minutes that we have before we start properly, take the opportunity to be social, use the chat function in the webinar to introduce yourselves. Um, it's a difficult time. I think everyone appreciates that. So the way we communicate has changed. So look, don't be shy, post your uh, LinkedIn profiles or your Twitter handles. I'm sure there's lots of people here with lots of common interests. And if this can be a forum to help people uh, reach out and meet new collaborators, then great. So look, please, please feel free to use that chat uh, function and we'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes. So we're up to 160 people. Well, it's climbing quickly now. So as I said, people feel free to use the chat function just to introduce yourselves. Uh, LinkedIn profiles I've found have been particularly successful and it gives you an opportunity to uh, link in with people once the webinar is finished. It seems like we've got quite a shy crowd. Uh, I'm happy to start then. I'm John Mulcahy, I'm the Director of Sports Science Agency. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn if you search John Mulcahy, that's M-U-L-C-A-H-Y. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, it's at Sport Sci Agency. Uh, so as I said, if people want to use the chat function, then um, please feel free. So we've got about a minute before we get started. Just under 200 people joining us now, hopefully from all over the world. Okay, nearly there. So just ticking over 200 people joining us. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Well, people are really coming in now. So hello to everyone who didn't see us at the start. My name's John. I'll be hosting the webinar. Uh, and I think it's time to start. So, hi everyone, I'm John Mulcahy. I'm the director of the Sports Science Agency. We're a partner of ECSS, and they've asked if I'd hope host this webinar this evening. Uh, today is a partnership between the Andalusian Institute of Sport and UPO, who will be hosting the 25th annual Congress of the European College of Sports Science in Seville uh, in October later this year. We're very lucky to be joined uh, by Professor Jose Antonio Lopez Calvet. Uh, Professor Calvet is an expert in exercise physiology and based at the University of Las Palmas in Gran Canaria. He has over 300 publications to his name, spanning an incredible range of research topics. And this evening, he's gonna be talking to us about reducing fat mass by prolonged walking and caloric restriction eliciting an energy deficit equivalent to four consecutive Ironman races. His talk will take between 20 and 25 minutes, and then we'll have about the same time to take any questions. So please feel free to use the question function in the webinar to post your questions as we go. I'll collate those and then ask him questions once his presentation has finished. Um, before we start, I would just like to remind everybody about the European College of Sports Science, uh, the Congress that's gonna be taking place in Seville later this year. It's the only major international sports science conference that's going to be taking place this year. So it offers an incredible opportunity for young researchers or people who've been in the industry slightly longer to get together, to network and to collaborate. So if you want more information on the ECSS Congress, 
just search ECSS Congress 2020, or if you want to go on Twitter, it's at E underscore C underscore S underscore S. If you can't stay for the full version of the webinar, then please don't worry because it will be recorded and it will be posted across the Andalusian Institute of Sports social, uh, social networks, as well as the ECSS social networks over the next couple of days. And I'm reliably informed that it will be translated with Spanish subtitles uh, over the next few days as well. So with that said, I'll hand over to Professor Calvet. Over to you, Professor. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you, and I would like uh, to thank everybody for joining us, and especially also the organizers for inviting me to, to participate in this uh, webinar. So my, my topic is about uh, how to deal with obese people, how to help them to reduce fat mass. And, uh, and of course, there are many reasons for doing this, and, and the most important ones are related to the fact that obesity is a disease and reduces the quality of life and also reduces life expectancy and also affects happiness. And uh, for those reasons, so it's important to treat obese people. And the, the higher the degree of obesity, the the higher is the, the impact in uh, health and the reduction in life expectancy is much larger in severely obese people than in people uh, sorry severely obese people in the right side and less severely obese people but all of these people they have a reduction in life expectancy so the problem of obesity arises from a disbalance between energy intake and expenditure with an excess of energy intake of expenditure. And this generates a positive energy balance and accumulation of energy in the form of fat. And this fat deposits in different uh, tissues and causes uh, lipotoxicity, inflammation, and many problems that we are not gonna be talking about. So, so then the solution is very easy. So we just need to reduce fat mass and the best way to achieve this is by increasing energy expenditure and reducing energy intake to create a negative energy balance. And uh, in the sports field, we know that just by doing exercise, you can reduce your fat mass. And uh, here I have uh, two different meta-analyses where they study what is the impact of just doing exercise without any diet uh, advice with uh, allowing the subjects in the program to eat uh, at libitum on body composition. And those studies, what they, in general, what they show is that even without uh, taking a special care with food, it's possible to reduce your body fat just by doing exercise, but the effect of this is rather moderate. So you can reduce your body weight by 0.5 per kilos just by doing this. That values are the mean of the different studies that uh, have been performed. In some cases, of course, there are individual cases where you can achieve uh, larger reductions in uh, body fat and there are also individual cases where there is no reduction in, uh, in body fat uh, with only exercise. So on this effect, this reduction of 0 0.5 to 4 kilos is really discouraging because uh, for people with severe obesity or with uh, uh, body mass index uh, above 30, 35 or 40, this means uh, very little effect. And uh, because many of these people have uh, comorbidities that may affect life expectancy, doctors had to, to look for better solutions. And there is a better solution, a drastic solution, and this is surgery. And uh, in this case, surgery means to reduce the capacity of the intestine to absorb and digest food. And this type of surgery is called bariatric surgery. 
bariatric surgery was introduced many years ago and it's a rather expensive uh, procedure. It may cost between seven and 12,000 euros depending on countries and uh, situations, but it's very efficient. So here we have a, a meta-analysis of, of the effects of different uh, treatments. Here we have the control group that rubic people that are following the normal medical advice. And here we have three different types of bariatric surgery. And uh, as you can see, the subjects that uh, underwent bariatric surgery, they lost substantial amount of, of body weight. The body weight was reduced by 30% after one year in one group, in the other one 25, the other one 20% with a different kind of surgeries. And then they are able more or less to maintain the weight. They regain a little bit, but the long-term, even after 20 years after the surgery, most subjects are able to have uh, beneficial effects of the intervention that are much more than the effect of the normal medical advice. I want you to focus specifically in this part of the intervention. During the first six months, the patients that have been subjected to bariatric surgery are losing a mean of 100 to 150 grams of fat every day. So that means that they have a negative energy balance of between 1,000 and 1,500 kilocalories per day. So that they are in a really big uh, negative uh, energy balance. So, and the point is that if we want to compete uh, with uh, this treatment, but uh, using a non-invasive uh, approach, like uh, doing exercise, we have to look for exercise interventions that are, uh, that should be much more demanding, that should elicit uh, a lot of energy expenditure. So, and uh, we wanted to see if this is possible. So we did some, uh, some search, and um, and if we look at the amount of energy deficit that can be achieved during exposed activities, for example, during the Tour of France, the energy expenditure, mini energy expenditure of the riders is around 6,000 kilocalories per day. And after an Ironman, the energy expenditure in men may be above 10,000 kilocalories and in women above 8,000 kilocalories, and the energy deficit in the Ironman may be going up to 6,000 kilocalories in men and uh, 5,000 kilocalories in women. This data of Ironman refer to amateur uh, uh, triathletes that are able to complete the race in 12, 13 hours or a little bit more. So, so then uh, we thought, okay, so if we want to apply a similar model to people with overweight, we have to take into account that they cannot ride like a cyclist and they cannot neither uh, perform like a triathlete, but they can do other type of exercise. And uh, so then uh, we thought, okay, so if we want to achieve an energy deficit similar to an Ironman, so we will have to combine a type of exercise that can be done by overweight people. And the easiest one will be walking and a pace that can be sustained. And uh, if we have uh, overweight people walking for eight hours, for example, at four and a half, two, uh, four and a half kilometers per hour speed, so the energy deficit that this may cost will be around 3,000 kilocalories, more or less. So, so if we want to achieve the level of an Ironman, the deficit that triathletes have during an Ironman, so we need to add calories restriction. And uh, that means that we have to remove about 2,400 kilocalories from the diet. And if we do this, so then we can have an energy deficit of 5,400 uh, kilocalories. So, so after these uh, theoretical calculations, we, we decided to put this to work. And uh, we, we recruited uh, 15 volunteers. This was done in, uh, in Ostersund in, uh, in Sweden. 
and uh, we they were all men between 27 and 54 years of age uh, with a VO2 max of 49 milliliters per kilogram we are physically active but uh, not doing a lot of exercise and uh, we randomized them in two groups one group that will be walking for four days having as the only food 0 0.8 grams of sucrose per kilogram of body weight that means that they were having about 320 kilocalories per day as the only energy and that means a restriction in the uh, energy intake to less than 10 percent of the energy demand more or less and the other group composed by eight subjects they had only 0 0.8 grams of whey protein they only had whey protein nothing more than whey protein and uh, and uh, the subjects came to the lab before the walking phase and were tested we measure many things on them body composition uh, vo2 max with uh, one arm cranking vo2 max with the other arm cranking vo2 uh, max while uh, pedaling we also measure uh, body composition and we took a muscle biopsy from both deltoid muscle that means a muscle biopsy from the right arm and a muscle biopsy from the left arm and we also took a muscle biopsy from the vastus lateralis and then the subjects were allowed to recover for seven days we collect information about the diet physical activity etc and then they came back to the lab after those seven days and uh, under fasting conditions we took uh, blood samples and then they performed arm cranking with only one arm that was assigned randomly during 45 minutes and the intensity was quite low only 15 percent of the maximal arm cranking intensity during an incremental arm cranking exercise and then right after the arm cranking they went out for a walk and they were walking for eight hours so they did this for four days and after the fourth day the fifth day in the morning they came back to the lab and we repeated the muscle biopsies in the two deltoid muscles and also in the vastus lateralis we took blood samples we did the same measurements that we did at the beginning and then during the next three days they were allowed to eat the same amount of food that they were taking before entering in the program and they were also allowed to do some walking but no more than 10,000 steps per day and after three days of isoenergetic diet we perform again the same type of measurements and we did again uh, muscle biopsies in the vastus lateralis and in the deltoid muscle of course when you do this type of intervention there are many things that uh, are happening so in this slide you can see some of the subjects doing one arm cranking and uh, the walking phase and some of the muscle biopsies that were obtained during the intervention so with this type of uh, intervention of course uh, because the energy deficit is very severe the body weight is reduced and in, in, in this case uh, our subject lost uh, five kilos in uh, just four days this is after the four days walking and they recover approximately uh, two kilos after this energetic diet phase and this is a water shift and then when they came back one month later they still had uh, reduced body weight body composition analysis show that with the walking phase with the four days walking uh, with uh, calorie restriction they lost 2.1 kilograms of fat and then during the three days of iso energetic diet that they were doing only a little bit of walking they lost seven, seven, 700 additional grams of fat so that means that from the start to the seventh day of intervention they have lost 2.8 kilograms of fat and when they came back to the lab one month later they lost an additional kilogram of body fat the subjects were instructed after the 
is an energetic phase. That means at the end of this phase, after the biopsy, is that they could do what they wanted. They could go to, back to their normal life, or they could uh, try to be active. We, we, t we told them that we didn't care much about what they were doing. We wanted to check if there was a rebound effect. That means if they were regaining the fat that they have lost one month, uh, three weeks after the end of the intervention. And actually, they didn't re regain the fat max. They actually lost an additional kilogram of fat max on their own. So the problem is that uh, when you do this type of interventions, you cause uh, serious uh, homeostatic change in the neuroendocrine system. And, uh, and one of the things that is happening is that uh, to maintain uh, uh, the glycemia, you have to activate the gluconeogenesis. And, uh, and to activate the gluconeogenesis is necessary to activate the proteolysis. And one of the things that happen with people uh, losing uh, weight is that part of the weight that is lost, approximately 25% of the weight loss is fat-free mass. And this has been shown with interventions that were uh, inducing moderate uh, energy deficits. So if the energy deficit is more serious, so then the amount, the proportion of fat-free mass that is lost is a little bit larger. That's what happened with the uh, with a very low calorie diet. So then one of the aims of, uh, of the interventions is to try to minimize the loss of um, uh, free, free, fatty, uh, free, free fat mass. Because in that way, it's easier to preserve the health status and to maintain the overall energy expenditure. And why is that? Uh, reduction of fat-free mass occurring. This is occurring in part because cortisol is increased. This is the changes during the day of cortisol in soldiers before an intervention that consisted in a sleep deprivation and a lot of exercise during seven, during uh, seven, five to four to five days. And as you can see here, cortisol was increased after the start of the uh, training course, and it was elevated during the period of energy deficit. And then when the soldiers were allowed to eat again, they recovered the levels of cortisol. So cortisol is increased by severe energy deficits. And cortisol is, uh, when it arrives to the muscle, it enters in the cell, it joins to the uh, glucocorticoid receptors go to the nucleus and activates the mRNA synthesis for FOXOS. And those transcription factors, they activate the atrophy gene program, and this uh, results in activation of ubiquitin protein, some protein degradation, and also in autophagy. And this results in a degradation or breakdown of proteins from the muscle and reduction in muscle mass. In addition, uh, cortisol and glucocorticoids, they have an anti-anabolic an anti effect. So they plant the anabolic action of EGF-1. The anabolic action of insulin is also blocked because they block the anabolic effect of AKT. And also they block the anabolic effect of testosterone that acts through AKT and also via the catenin pathway. And they also impact the anabolic action of amino acids. So, so the increase in cortisol acts in both sides. It increases protein degradation and it impedes protein synthesis. In addition, with uh, severe energy deficits, Another endocrine change that occurs is that testosterone is reduced. You can see here in the soldiers, the normal testosterone fluctuation during the day and how testosterone is reduced when they start to do a lot of exercise and then how testosterone remains very low during the next days. And when they start to eat again, testosterone recovers the normal levels. So, and in our Soviets, of course, cortisol went up and testosterone went down. And in addition, another change that occurs with uh, 
a severe energy deficit is that insulin is reduced and leptin is also reduced. Insulin is another hormone that uh, has anabolic effects. And uh, during a severe energy deficit and also during a starvation, uh, insulin resistance develops. And this insulin resistance is in part also facilitated by the increase in free fatty acids that also occur in oxalates. In addition, uh, EGF1, uh, insulin like growth factor one, that is an anabolic factor, is also reduced during energy deficit. So overall, there is a marked reduction in anabolic input to the muscle and an increase in the catabolic input to the muscle. And uh, uh, with this situation, the limb mass of our subjects was reduced, but it was reduced less in the control arm that did not perform any exercise during the process of, of the four days of uh, walking and, and energy restriction. But uh, in the train arm, this effect was slightly blunted. And in the legs that did eight hours of exercise compared to the train arm that only did 45 minutes per day, in the legs, the effect was much less. So there was a reduction in the loss of limb mass in the legs of 57% compared to the effect of in the control arm. So that means that exercise spare muscle mass during the process of uh, inducing the severe energy deficit. So then we, we look at the mechanism by which exercise attenuates the loss of muscle mass. And uh, we look at protein synthesis, and uh, we saw that protein synthesis is not uh, activated during this process, protein synthesis signaling, as expected, with so many blocks to the anabolic actions. And on the other side, protein degradation was increased. We further look at the effect of uh, the administration of proteins in this process. We were thinking that by giving protein, we will be able to attenuate the reduction in, uh, in, uh, in limb mass and to attenuate protein breakdown. And actually, the group that was having a weight protein had much larger concentrations of brain chain fatty, uh, brain chain amino acids, and also, of course, leucine, that is one of them and uh, which has a good uh, anabolic effect and, and anti-catabolic effect in the muscle. But despite this increase in uh, brain chain amino acid in the group that was ingesting uh, whey protein, we didn't see any effect of the brain chain amino acid in, uh, in the muscle mass. And, uh, and this uh, was due to the fact that uh, during a severe energy deficit, protein synthesis signaling is blunted. So the muscle becomes uh, refractory to the stimulation of amino acids during severe energy deficit. So then we look at the effect of, uh, of uh, exercise on muscle catabolism. Muscle catabolism during starvation is produced by the ubiquitin proteasome system, that is the predominant one during starvation also by autophagy and to much less uh, amount by calpine proteases. So what uh, we saw in the muscle biopsies is that uh, exercise mitigates the loss of muscle mass by attenuating the activation of autophagy during the severe energy deficit. And this, this was evidenced by a reduction in the legs of the phosphorylation of one protein that is called Becklin-1 that is necessary for the activation of autophagy. So that meant that uh, the legs were losing much less muscle mass in our subjects because the exercise was inhibiting autophagy in the legs. So, and, and this finding is important because there are drugs that can be used to inhibit autophagy. Finally, I want to comment briefly in, in, briefly in other changes that occur during the intervention. With a severe energy deficit, ketone bodies are increased. This is a classical study by Cahill in which they had subjects starving 
meaning having no food during 40 days. And they measure the changes in ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are produced in the liver from free fatty acids, and, and they are produced in larger amounts as the days of, star, of the starvation are passing to achieve values around six millimoles after 40 days. So, and it was obvious they had increased uh, uh, ketone bodies and beta hydroxy butyrate after four days was expected to be here according to Cahill data. And actually, the sucrose group was here, had less um, ketone bodies, but the whey protein group was where it was expected to be. So, and those ketone bodies, they have several effects that are beneficial. At the beginning, at the start, the increase of ketone bodies disturbs uh, the normal redox balance, and they, uh, they produce uh, oxidative stress, and then this oxidative stress uh, produces the activation of signaling through NRF2 that activates the, the program, the antioxidant response program, and this generates an increase of the antioxidant enzymes and also a reduction of the injury related genes, and this causes uh, an increase in the antioxidant capacity. In addition, the increase of beta hydroxybutyrate has been shown to have an anti inflammatory effect and also is producing a reduction in sympathetic nervous system activity that may reduce energy expenditure. Uh, another effect that uh, uh, ketone bodies have is that they produce an increase also of uh, a cytokine, a myokine that is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That's a hormone that is also produced by the brain. And this hormone brain-derived neurotrophic factor is uh, very important for the brain. It has many positive effects in the brain. And uh, this hormone is also stimulated by prolonged exercise. So, so when subjects are in situations where they have uh, energy deficit and they have increases in ketone bodies, or when they are doing a lot of exercise, when the right neurotrophic factor is increased, and this increase in brain, brain derived neurotrophic factor is maybe blunted if you if you eat sugar during the intervention. So so we will expect a lower increase in brain derived neurotrophic factor in the subject that had only sucrose compared to the ones having only protein. But uh, the important thing is that the increase in brain derived neurotrophic factor is also having an effect on appetite. It inhibits appetite. And also they produce, uh, um, in, at least in animals, they stimulate the performance of exercise. They stimulate the uh, activities that produce energy expenditure. And they also improve mood state. So, so for these reasons, uh, this type of intervention that combines exercise with, uh, to produce a large volumes of exercise, to produce a very large energy deficit, together with caloric restriction, they are uh, not that difficult to, to fulfill and it will, as, as one will think, uh, uh, to start with. So, so I would like to summarize the important message from this, uh, from this presentation, and is that uh, reducing fat mass by prolonged walking and caloric restriction is feasible and well tolerated. It permits, it, it allows to burn a lot of fat uh, while preserving most of the muscle mass. It induces a marked elevation of uh, ketone bodies in blood, and we have seen that this, uh, this can be rather positive, and it has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. In addition, we have uh, mentioned that the skeletal muscle is refractory to the anabolic effect of protein during a severe energy deficit. So, and this opens for the question that, uh, that it is of any use to ingest proteins when you want to reduce your, your fat mass, at least when you want to do it in, a, in this way that is a, a very fast and efficient way of reducing fat mass. 
So I would like uh, to thank the organizers again for inviting me to, to be here. And, uh, and of course, most likely there are many attendants that uh, they may think uh, that uh, they would like to, to try this. Of course, one place to, to try this is one Canaria. It's a perfect place to be walking outside and, and trying to lose a lot of fat mass, especially in winter time. This, uh, the, the, the studies, uh, the study I have presented is the outcome of the collaboration of uh, our Faculty of Forest Science together with the Faculty of the Winter Research Center in uh, Ostesun. And, uh, and this is the product of the work of many that are mentioned in this slide. So thank you very much for your presentation. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Professor. That was excellent. So um, as Professor Colbert said, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them uh, in the question section. Um, on the webinar and we'll uh, we'll relay those over and get those answered. There are a couple that came in while you were talking, um, Professor, one from Pedro in Spain who asked, this was early on, uh, he said, would you advise similar interventions for people who are overweight rather than obese? Now, I think let's take that question slightly broader and just talk about the, the challenges of obesity versus being overweight. So uh, how early would you look to put in some of the interventions that you spoke about um, with people who are overweight versus obese? Okay, it will be easier to do this with someone that is overweight than obese. That, uh, that's because the mechanical load uh, for walking is very large. And uh, obese people, they will have back pain, they will have pain in the, uh, in the feet, they will have uh, uh, knee pain easily. So then uh, this, this should not be done uh, to start with. This was an experiment, to, was a proof of concept experiment. So, but uh, with proper uh, adaptation, so, so obese people could be starting to walk longer and longer distances. At, uh, and then depending on the, on the response to, the, to one hour, two hours walking, Longer walks could be introduced during the weekends and, uh, and one Friday, Saturday, uh, maybe Sunday, they could manage to do four, six hours walking. And by repeating those cycles uh, several times during one or two months, they will be able to achieve a very large uh, reductions in fat mass. So we have some experience doing this in, uh, in our lab and we have had uh, remarkable responses in some people yeah. with obesity and overweight with this kind of programs. And uh, Alejandro has asked one here, uh, specifically around the soldiers, how many hours um, had they been asleep? So how many hours were they, how many hours were they asleep for during the study? In the soldier study, uh, that is not our study, it was a study that was done in Norway many years ago. So in those studies, they are sleeping between two and four hours every day. So they have, they have substantial sleep deprivation. And uh, yeah. this may contribute to some of the uh, endocrine effects of, uh, of the severe energy deficit that, that, that uh, are seen in the soldiers. And that, that would have a major impact, wouldn't it? Sleep, sleep deprivation on the, sort of on, the, on the hormonal responses? It, it may affect, uh, for example, leptin, it may affect uh, ghrelin, ghrelin response may be affected, but uh, the rest of the, of the responses are more or less similar. I mean, the increase in cortisol and the reduction in testosterone and the reduction in uh, thyroid hormone that uh, we didn't mention here is also yeah. seen. And, uh, and uh, this, this will not be much affected by the sleep deprivation but it seems that leptin changes and uh, ghrelin changes could be affected by the sleep deprivation. Uh, um, some nice questions here. So one, uh, do you have any data on classic metabolic health markers, e.g. insulin resistance, HDL, TAG, before and after the intervention? Uh, yes, we, we measure HDL 
HDL cholesterol. HDL yeah. cholesterol was uh, was increased and uh, quite substantially actually. But as soon as they start to eat, it went back to where it was. So, so it seems that there is an acute response of the intervention in terms of improving the lipid profile that goes back as soon as they start to eat. And the other, the other was one was uh, HDL cholesterol, and the other, the other question was about CAG, uh, growth hormone, or yeah, growth hormone, uh, growth so. growth growth hormone went up. We measured growth hormone, and it was increased during the phase of uh, food deprivation and uh, severe energy deficit. Uh, and a last question here. Did you find any variable able to significantly predict individual body weight or fat mass changes? We, we, didn't, uh, we didn't look at this. We there's a small number of uh, subjects. But uh, in the literature, it's, it's reported that uh, subjects uh, having uh, more fat mass, they lose with this type of uh, energy deficit, they lose more than the subjects having uh, less fat mass. So, so in theory, those subjects that are uh, having uh, a greater degrees of obesity will benefit more from this type of intervention. Uh, nice one here. Could you tell us something about the subjective feelings of the subjects during the four days uh, of CRE period? So. Yeah, so, so we asked uh, them about uh, hunger, for example, if they were hungry or not. We were expecting they, they would be very hungry and that the hunger will be worsening with the accumulation of energy deficit. But actually, they, they rate their hunger in a scale from zero to 10 in the area of five, six, after one day of intervention. And they, stay, they stood like this during the rest of the time. So, and uh, regarding, uh, they also were commenting about uh, having some problems to sleep at night after doing that much exercise. Uh, they, they, they also, some of them, they were commenting on uh, weird feelings uh, that maybe that may be related to the effect of, you know, of the neuroendocrine changes in, in the brain and the ketone bodies in the brain. But they, but they were very positive because we were asking them every day, uh, are you willing to continue or you want to withdraw? Are you happy with the intervention? And they were quite happy to continue because the effect of every day was really dramatic. I mean, they were, they were losing uh, one kilo per day. So, so they were really feeling it in the belt. Yeah, yeah. I guess that helps people stay motivated as well if you're losing that much weight. Yeah, they were they were very motivated, and uh, and and we have I have the perception that uh, probably because of the increase of uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor, but also because uh, because the, the endocannabinoid uh, system may be also be stimulated by by severe energy restriction. So the combination of both factors, you know, brain-derived neurotrophic factor going up, that is known to be positive for mood state, and also the endocannabinoid uh, stimulation caused by, by the exercise and maybe by the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, could uh, be one of the mechanisms that facilitate the performance of this kind of intervention. Yeah. And I mean, you, you spoke a lot about, well, I mean, walking was the type, was in the title. Um, would there be anything different around strength training? We've had a question here um, that would maybe strength training, adding that to the protocol, could that help mitigate or change some of the anti-catabolism responses? Yeah, I, I, to, to ask for this question, I will, I will use a, a slide. Yeah. Because uh, there is a, a very nice study on uh, strength training, and uh, in this case, uh, this was an intervention lasting for 30 weeks in total, and uh, the, the subjects that were recruited, they had a body initial body weight of 149 kilos, a percentage of body fat of 49%. And they were doing uh, uh, many kind of exercise, 
walk in and uh, and also uh, exercise different exercise in the gym, including uh, weightlifting. And uh, what they saw in this intervention is that after 30 weeks, doing two to four hours exercise per day with uh, moderate uh, caloric restriction, not like the one with it. After 30 weeks, they lost 50 kilos of fat and 10 kilos of free fat mass. So that is uh, even more that, that uh, you, you see normally with uh, bariatric surgery. So, so this can be done uh, with different approaches. Uh, we did it walking, but it can be done uh, uh, with uh, weight lifting or combining weight lifting with uh, with walk with uh, walking or or including a high intensity exercise. Uh, but the important thing is to have a very large energy deficit. Yeah. And and do you feel so? Sticking on this theme for a second. Do you feel actually sometimes walking is the best thing to start with and then maybe you progress people to different energy for uh, sorry exercise formats as i guess they become more comfortable with the you'd almost start from the notion that if people are overweight or obese they're probably not that efficient from an exercise point of view anyway no the, the, can, can you repeat the question because again, sorry yeah, that's so I think it's more it's more about the process that you would take people through from an exercise intervention. Would you recommend starting with easier easier exercises like yeah, walking? Yeah, of course, and of course, then of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, um, you will have to ask uh, the subjects. What do you like? Do you like to walk? Do you like to do this or that? And try to look for uh, an exercise type that they like and that they can perform for hours. That will be yeah. the way to go, and then look at tolerance. If they if they tolerate it, uh, we had resting periods between the the walking eight hours walking time. So they they were not walking continuously. They were walking for one hour, resting ten minutes, another hour, etc. Et so you have to organize the session in such a way that it can be done yeah. and accommodated to the needs of the of the subjects. But eight hours is a long time to be walking. Um, so we've had a nice question here. What's the minimum uh, time walking that you would recommend? So daily time, what would you recommend as a minimum? There is no minimum. I mean, I would say that, uh, that uh, anyone trying to lose a lot of fat uh, should try to do as much as, as he can. But, uh, been uh, trying to be on the safe side, try, trying to avoid uh, overloading injuries. So, so there is no no minimum. So, any any small time walking will be good. Um, the epidemiologists will say that uh, even 15 minutes walking every day is good. So, yeah. but I would say that uh, that people should try to to do one two hours walking every day and uh, they can split this into different moments along the day and if they are people with obesity and they want to lose a lot of fat very fast they have to try to work as, uh, and combine working with other exercises and do as much as they can uh another a very practical question um did you report any injuries among the participants such as blisters yes so there was some uh, some Soviets having uh, blisters. So because they were in, they were put into an experiment, and uh, and they were walking many hours without being used to. So so we had measures to try to to prevent this. That is to have uh, appropriate uh, shoes, um, also socks that are appropriate uh, removing the socks after walking for one hour allow the the feet to dry out with air put back uh, dry dry socks etc so so it's quite important that uh, that uh, this is introduced in a progressive way to avoid blisters and uh, tendinitis and uh, another kind of overloading problems and, and were there um 
were there major differences between men and women um, from both uh, metabolic yeah. and, and uh, yeah. general? Yeah. I would like to be able to answer this question, <laughs> but uh, because we didn't have uh, women in the intervention, and uh, what I can what I can say is what is known or published in the literature, and there is very little actually about uh, how much how female would respond to this. We have so many male data that indicate that uh, when rats female rats, when they are under severe energy deficit, they start faster. They, they stop uh, having menses and they, they lose much more uh, free fat mass. And they die earlier, actually. They also have, uh, in, in, in rodents, if they do memory tests, for example, they are able to memorize much better. They increase more their brain-derived neurotrophic factor than, than males, and they improve memory more. They, uh, they are able, they do more exercise. They have uh, the, the, the behavior of doing exercise, for example, in the, in the small wheels that they have in the cage. So they do more exercise spontaneously than the males. In the case of uh, humans, what we know is that, for example, uh, when when men and women starve, women lose more leptin. The leptin is reduced more in women than men, and and insulin, for example, is reduced a little bit more in in men than women. But I cannot say at the end if uh, if men will respond better, reducing more the fat mass than than women. But uh, we actually have a study going in this moment where we are looking at this and uh, our preliminary data seem to indicate that uh, that uh, women they have a little bit more difficulty to, to lose uh, fat mass than men with this type um, of information that would be the opposite to... of what is seen in robins actually and what about differences between children and adults obviously Childhood obesity is an increasing issue. Um, yeah, I again. Yeah, this this is also a very interesting question, but I cannot answer this question. There, there is no no intervention of this type with children, as far as I know. Okay, uh, I've got another one on, on resistance exercise. Again, a very practical group that that we presented to. It says, is there any evidence on whether the addition of resistance exercise during such severe en energy deficit may further enhance the muscle preserving effect of exercise? This is also a very good question. Um, I don't think we have uh, studies in humans looking uh, specifically at this. There are, there are some studies looking at uh, trying to find out if uh, by doing a strength training, you can preserve the muscle mass while you are dieting, but not under this level of energy deficit that we were studying. In the, with moderate energy deficits, it is possible, it's possible to blunt completely the loss of muscle mass in some muscles. But I don't think this will be possible in all muscles, if you do whole body uh, strength training. That is probably because some muscles, they are uh, preserving more easily the muscle mass with the strength training than others. Uh, we've got, an, it's, again, nice, some nice questions coming through. So, um, someone's asked about what about the combination of short resting periods? Um, so you'd look at medium training periods of between three and three and a half hours. And so 1,200 to 15,000 calories um, waste by cycling. Do you suggest some protein intake to compensate the muscle loss? Um, uh, okay, protein, protein uh, the, the, the important thing here is the energy deficit. So, yeah. If you if you you can organize the session the way you want, you need to make the session to be feasible, and you can have resting periods anytime you want. So then then of course you can use the resting period to keep uh, 
food to your subjects, but you don't want to give a lot of food if you want to, to elicit uh, a very large energy deficit. So you should not give only proteins. If you give uh, something, it will have to be proteins mixed with, uh, with some carbohydrate, not only proteins. But uh, what is known about proteins is that if the energy deficit is moderate, by increasing the amount of proteins to around two grams per kilo of body weight, so you can partially you have you can blunt partially the loss of muscle mass. But if the deficit is severe, as the case we have, what we have seen is that uh, with 0 0.8 grams per kilo of uh, of uh, whey protein, we we couldn't do anything. And there are other studies where they have gone up to 1.5 or 2 grams, and they didn't, they didn't see neither a benefit uh, from the protein in terms of aspiring muscle mass. That means that in the situation of very severe energy deficit, the muscle is uh, really refractory to the anabolic effect of uh, of amino acids. So what we don't know if that uh, if by giving even more proteins or combining the proteins with carbohydrates to have a large increase on, of insulin during the recovery periods, there will be a possibility of uh, overcoming this anabolic resistance that the muscles has during severe energy deficit. Uh, and we, we don't have that much time left, so I have a couple of questions for you, um, specifically about ECSS. So, um, You'll be presenting at ECSS this year, which I'm thought, sure we're all looking forward to. A slightly different topic, um, something close to my heart about sprinting. But what are you most looking forward to about ECSS and coming to Sevilla? Well, Sevilla is, uh, is a great opportunity. Uh, the first, the first thing is that uh, the the European uh, College meeting is one of the most important meetings in sport science in the world. And actually, there are uh, participants for from eighty or hundred different countries joining, and uh, most uh, the most significant researchers in the field will be there. So it's a great opportunity to to try to meet uh, the the experts and try to to discuss about the science. And uh, and and there is another aspect of Seville. This is a city that I really like. I, I have been there many times. It's a very friendly and walkable city. Uh, you can go by bike easily from A to B. Uh, and, uh, and it's uh, one of the most uh, interested, interesting uh, cities in the world in terms of, of uh, touristic activities and social life. The, the Spanish tapas in Seville are, are among the best uh, in Spain. And uh, good wine, and uh, and uh, there is also a lot of uh, architectural uh, attractive uh, buildings, and um, and you have a nice opportunity uh, to see one of the most important Spanish cities in in the Middle Age and in the Renaissance. So it's a nice I'm, opportunity to join Seville. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm certainly looking forward to it. It seems. It seems almost mean for us to be talking about how great the food is and the wine is in Seville after a talk on um, producing major calorific deficits. But I, I do have one more that kind of you know, leads on from that. So uh, the question is, you showed that weight loss was maintained for a month. Do you have any data yeah. or anecdotal information about later weight relapse? Would you expect severe energy deficit approach to induce yeah, more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, this was not planned at the beginning, but uh, as we saw that they were losing uh, some extra weight uh, after one, after three weeks uh, after the end of the intervention, so we called them back one year later. And then what uh, the mean of the mean of the group was still having a benefit from the intervention, but there were some subjects that had win the weight, and there were some others that they have lost even more weight. There was one of weight by his arm. So he learned how to do the thing and he did it himself and he came back with uh, much less uh, fat. So what I mean is that the long term with uh, proper motivation, 
with uh, control. It means uh, personal trainers, etc. So there are many chances that uh, a substantial amount of obese people with uh, motivation will be able to manage to reduce the fat mass uh, substantially. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, just to go back to ECSS, we have a lot of uh, quite young researchers and undergraduates on the webinar at the moment. So what would you recommend? Well, I guess, why would you recommend they visit um, the Congress in Seville? So from a career or development or research point of view, what would be the, the main benefits? Yeah, what in, uh, in, the, in the city of Seville or during the event? For, for the Congress, so yeah, if you're a young researcher. Uh, for the con what would you yeah, for, from the Congress, I think uh, that uh, they should look at the, at the program and select the lectures that they may like, depending on their interest. And uh, if they want to see uh, rather uh, competitive uh, lectures, they should join uh, the Young Investigator Award sessions, where the young investigators, they will be presenting and, uh, and some of the senior uh, members of the college will be asking questions to decide uh, which uh, presentation is going to be winning and those uh, young investigators awards many of those uh, presentations are, are very interesting too so there are there will be plenty of uh, chances of uh, finding uh, interesting topics in every domain of sport science in Seville. Well, uh, Professor Calvert as ever time is against us so thank you very much for that presentation it's it's fascinating stuff um, and to everyone who's been listening, thank you for your attention. Um, just to reiterate that this webinar will be across um, the Andalusian Institute of Sports social uh, social channels over the next couple of days. The ECSS's social channels, and it will also be translated into Spanish for you probably early next week. Um, so, look, as as we said at the start, it's a difficult time for everybody, but. As sports scientists, I think we have a certain amount of skills and we can certainly help people through lockdown across Europe. So if that's helping people by reaching out and informing them what the best things to do around exercise, diet, nutrition uh, and staying happy from a psychological point of view, then please use your skills to help everybody. Um, so from there, we'll say good night, goodbye and uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you for joining. Bye.